Welcome, Juho. I am uh, Annalisa Metta, and on behalf of the Uzbekistan Pavilion at the Hart Biennale in Venice, I give you our warmest welcome to this event. This is a public meeting that is named Wild Thinking, Wilderness from Being an Obstacle to a New Way of Thinking. This event was conceived and curated by Antonio Hire, and uh, he has had to meet, to debate together about the relation between art and science. And in particular, about how the relation between art and science can help us to understand the current world. And so considering wilderness, complex adaptive systems theory, and art and science relationship, we could change our point of view and then learn how to deal with unpredictability, and even, perhaps, to welcome it. I'm very happy to be here, but uh, at the same time, I'm very sad, because uh, at my position, we will have Antonio Hire, that is the curator of this event, but unfortunately, he is with a wild, I can say, flu, and so he has not a chance to be here uh, today. Uh, but we'll do our best, for sure, and uh, we will uh, have an uh, afternoon articulated in three moments. The first one is a recorded Antonio Hire's performance titled You Are Not Unique. A second moment is a round of short presentation with my colleagues and friends Caterina Benincasa and Piero Dominici that are here with us today. And uh, finally, we have a recorded interviews on the topic plant communication and behaviors taken by Antonio Hire himself with Professor Velemer Ninkovic and Umberto Castiello. We will start with a performance by Antonio Hire himself. Uh, just a few words to introduce you, Antonio Hire. He is an Italian independent artist, performer, and researcher with a specific experience in the field of art, science, and interaction. Currently, he is developing site-specific and uh, audience-oriented piece of art in relation between art and uh, science. He is uh, at um, the meeting point between relational artworks and visual art, exploring the borders between third theater and uh, performance art. Starting from art and science as ways of knowledge, he works on sci heart research project about plant communication. Uh, Antonio wrote, uh, wrote me a few lines asking me to write them to you, and I'm very happy to give, to give him his voice. Dear all, you can probably feel how much I am sad about not being there physically, Thanks again to Uzbekistan National Pavilion for the opportunity. Anyway, since the day is dedicated to wilderness, I want to take profit of this inconvenience, adapt and serve the borders of chaos. Therefore, I want to make my absence an act of art, for sure. <laughs> it is, if it's true that I organized the day, it's also true that ideas pop up like mushrooms here and there. My absence is ideal for this pavilion, a special place for systemic thinking where art almost disappears. So I give to you my last video, which I feel is perfect for this occasion. The title is You Are Not Unique and enjoy the talk. So we'll see Antonio Ira performance.
So thanks to Antonio Yure for this very special contribution. It was exactly for this occasion. And uh, uh, it's the perfect, I think, opening for our ongoing uh, uh, dialogue. And uh, we will start to discuss together exactly about the borders between art and science, between human and not humans, between science and uh, natural knowledge. And so what is happening to our current uh, um, culture in order to face the challenging dimension of our contemporary, putting together our different perspe perspective uh, and uh, disciplines. We will start with uh, Katerina Benincasa, that she's, uh, she's here. Uh, Katerina has a mixed background in physics, philosophy, history of science, aesthetics, contemporary art, and world heritage studies. Currently curator at European Commission's Joint Research Center SciArt project, her competence and interest lie at the crossroads of science, art, heritage driven by the need to communicate the beauty of research and curiosity. Her activity focuses on trans transdisciplinary art-science collaborations, arts and heritage, with art as a mode of research and inquiry. She co-founded class, Knowledge Link Through Art and Science, an artist in residence program at the Max Planck Society and the University of Groningen. She initiated Innovative Heritage, an ongoing program endorsed by UNESCO to foster dialogue and knowledge exchange between the contemporary art and heritage. She has many current pro projects today, and I'm pretty sure that she will tell us also about what is on, on her table now. So thank you, Katerina, for being here, and I will leave you the stage for um, presenting your ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Annalisa. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm glad to be here today and uh, speak about what we do at the intersections of arts and science at the European Commission and to tell you about our take on wilderness and on rethinking our ground. So there's something intrinsically special about, about art and science. Uh, in fact, there's a growing number of institutions, of universities, of NGOs and companies um, around the world that bring in artists to, in their laboratories, in their facilities, in their spaces, in their research avenues. And there's also, in fact, an increasing amount of programs that bring in scientists in the spaces of the artists. At the end of 2020, um, the, Europe, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, promoted this entanglement of the arts in all aspects of society, uh, insisting that the creative practices be a part of the fabric of our social dynamics. And she did this by promoting what she called the new European Bauhaus. So finally, we are seeing interest at the very high political level uh, to integrate the stuff that artists do at the very core of our activities, be this the construction of infrastructure, the development of new materials in governance and so on. Why? because the arts, artistic inquiry and practices are key to triggering a systemic shift. As Annalisa was saying earlier, and address today's wicked problems, which are in fact complex problems, or better artistic practices are so needed in our day-to-day -day life for us to make sense of the world, to give meaning and value, to bring cohesion and resilience in addition to research and innovation. So, but let me tell you a little bit um, about where I come from. Um, it might explain how we see art as an ingredient to rethink our common collective ground and how needed it is to open up our specialized ways of knowing, specifically I'm talking about the sciences, to the thick and intricate complexities of existence, of beingness. The European Commission 
has a scientific research center, and this research center is called the JRC, or the Joint Research Center. And it develops independent scientific research in support of EU policies. It is a vast, bustling set setup of sciences and researchers, apparatus and laboratories, spaces and stories. Topics range from artificial intelligence to soil research, ocean and marine research um, resources to smart grids, space safety, food security, migration, data governance, climate change, COVID, name it, it's there. In this landscape of cutting edge international research, there exists a tiny teeny eeny weeny project, uh, which is the arts and science program of the JRC, and that's where I am. What we do at arts and science um, is to create resonances, resonances between disciplines, of course, art and science, but we also bring in policy making, and that makes it extremely fun. What we do is to bring in artists to work alongside our researchers. They visit, explore, search, inquire, be wild. We ask them to be free in what most piques their curiosity. And uh, what these artists end up doing, um, mostly, is inquire further and deep into the inner workings of the science machine. Uh, a machine, as I said before, that uh, informs and supports legislations at the EU level. A lot of emphasis in arts and science is placed upon the process, the collaboration, the process of contamination of languages, of modes of being and relating, and the changes that happen in us throughout this contamination. But there's a lot of magic also arising from the production of the final piece. It does not always happen that an artwork results from the collaborations, but when it does, we tend to produce it and exhibit it. I here brought some examples um, this, by the way, is Ella Maria Aida, who's uh, also participating at the Sami Pavilion. Um, and um, the title of the 360 degrees film screen is called Aran 360. Artistic practice has this strong capacity to challenge assumptions and biases, perceptions, and standpoints. It is uh, great at relating emotionally and somehow it drives meaning and value. And a renewed dialogue. Importantly for us at the JSC, it makes us reflect on our science in a societal context. Our society has relegated the arts to the entertainment industry and science to the supremacy of knowledge. Our Western culture, from the Enlightenment, I would say, has given the primacy of knowledge to the eye. The eye is a as the organ that we have, but to the eye as a person um, as well. The person, the individual, is the center of the world. Humankind is placed at the center of the world as a seer, as an observer of all things, displacing and denying the interrelationality of other ways of connecting, which have always been another way of being, woven into other, older, ancient, non-European cultures. Ella Maria Eira here is showcasing her work, Eliat, um, and what it means to be a Sami artist in a reindeer, working in reindeer husbandry. But if you look at the many native or indigenous peoples around the globe, we realize that arts is deeply embedded in their social structures, in their norms and behaviors. In fact, in their also what we could call legal systems, dance, performance, painting, it's a political, it's a democratic practice. Can we learn to embrace the sensuousness and senses of being as well as all other beings and things in the, in, or, or entities. Can we know the world with our whole beingness of being and the world combined with imagination, intuition, and a sense of beyond, of that unknowable complexity wilderness? Let me bring you back to our activities, which is what Annalisa was mentioning earlier. It's one of our ongoing projects that we started earlier this year. Um, and this links directly to wilderness as a way of thinking, and I would argue as a way of being. Our latest project is called Naturarchy. Towards a Natural Contract is the subtitle, which is not there. Politically, it has to do with the Green Deal, which includes topics such as energy transition, climate neutrality, biodiversity loss, depletion of natural resources, etc. And this basically, this project basically asks, can we reimagine our ways of living and draw a world where human and non-human person and environment have the same legal standing? 
what we're trying to highlight through this, through naturarchy, is a deep, deep interdependency and entanglement between human and non-human. The relation of human rights also to environment, importantly, land and property, and the relation between ancient and new knowledges, local knowledge and science, and systems of governance. Can we imagine a different way of relating to our surroundings, to our elements, to what sustains human life or life generally? Can we act differently? We tend to see a plant, a landscape, DNA, the air we breathe in, or stardust as there, as a given object. It is an object of inquiry, an object outside us, distant, emotionally distant as well, often, distinct. The world is there for us to be used and abused, perhaps, to our pleasure. We might not be taking into account the complexity and the interconnection between the pieces. We are reaching tipping points, for instance, the climate crisis, wilderness. Bear with me just another few minutes. But what if we were to start thinking of nature not as an object to be, uh, to be, to be used, not, uh, but as a subject with legal rights? Can we start decolonizing our take on nature um, and enter a more deep ecology, one that values other beings and things, as well as their intrinsic times and matter reality, which is very different from the times or the time scales of the human, of the individual. One that does not depend on systems of, very often, it is sovereignty and exploitation, possession and control. And this is what we're investigating at the JOC with artists, scientists, philosophers, policymakers. So why is it needed? Why is an artistic take needed in order to reestablish a greater interdependency? Well, art and science is simply what happens when art and artist comes together with a scientist. And it is a transdisciplinary practice um, of discovering across disciplines, disciplines and methodological boundaries. I can assure you that it is quite magical. Um, and it's a very potent cocktail of doing things and acting. And I think the magic lies in the transformative potential and power of art and the imagination. So um, I finally get to my examples. You've seen some before. Uh, this is Kat Austin, um, who sonifies the chemical properties of melting of, of water in the Arctic, of melting ice, for instance, the pH, uh, she sonifies them and makes and turns this sound into music and records, giving us the opportunity to emotionally engage with, um, with the Arctic and with what's happening with the melting of glaciers. This is Siobhan MacDonald. Um, I don't know whether it's too small, the writing at the end. It's a series of works um, under the main title, Invisible uh, Seam. She works with soils, with permafrost, and with gases. And what she looks at here, she, when, when, uh, uh, when the permafrost melts, there's a release of gases. These gases can be poisonous for some species and uh, beneficial for others. So again, there, what is the interplay? In this, on the bottom right, she takes ancient ice cores and paints on top with uh, methane that is collected from the bog lands. Um, and these ancient ice cores melt. Lisa Togena and Joshua Portway here in weather prediction by numerical process. They uh, work with community. How much, what is the power of many, many people coming together? Um, it comes to basically big data. They work with cultural value and memory value um, and shows how potent that is to change uh, systems. Robertina Sibjanic, this is an audiovisual poetic reflection um, on what it is to live together. She takes sounds from under, underneath um, the water and mixes them from sounds from on top of the water from the um, Ljubljana uh, River and brings together different 
communities, not only of animals and other species, but also of humans um, living along this, this river. Um, And I Sondeur has worked with our scientists back in 2016, developing what she calls the Carbon Black Protocol, um, in which they, scientists extract the carbon particles from the masks, the face masks. What she does is symbolically put these particles in the ink that is used to print these pictures. Every day she uses a different mask. Every day there's a different picture, and the picture relates to the place where she is. Um, and this is how she wants to engage us with climate change or with the effects of industry on the planet. Penelope Kane, Think Like a Mountain, looks at the interconnection between materiality, in this case, the extraction of a salt that's called galena, um, and uh, looks that the galena salt has contained silver and the mines are being mined to extract silver. But in order to extract silver, you have to compress these crystals. And in the process, you have lead particles that go in the air and uh, move with the wind. And they end up somehow in uh, the Peruvian um, mountains, and the Peruvian mountains have uh, quite a lot of these lead particles, and so she maps the, uh, the motions of these particles across geographical uh, borders and sees and, and brings together the human, non-human, non and the geopolitical. Gemma Wilmore, I'll just have two examples and then I won't bore you anymore. Gemma Wilmore, the All River Species Act, she wants to bring together um, Earth systems and hum human systems, and in this case, she does it with AI and through indigenous philosophies in order to give rights uh, and a legal status to rivers so that it can't be exploited by human beings. And Yanis Kranidiotis is a more uh, perhaps traditional example of art and science. It is, he's an artist that works with physical phenomena and plays with light, motion, and sound to create um, immersive experiences where one can be imbued in the wonder of playing. Um, yeah, so I think um, these are the examples that I brought. It's a pity that Antonio is not here with us uh, with his performance. Um, my last question, and it was one that constantly comes up when we are working, is how can we embrace and deal with complexity within the boundaries and methodological constraints of our current systems, which are very often linear systems and classical systems? And um, this is, we're doing just through transdisciplinarity and diversity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katerina. It was very inspiring, and I'm very impressed from your point of view. Uh, also because you are inviting us to rethink our relation with nature, going outside of the idea of you know, ecological services uh, that uh, sometimes are the way we uh, are used to read the new Green Deal. It is really more and more than this, and your sensitiveness, your way to deal with emotion in not you know a trivial way, but in so rooted way, I think it's so crucial crucial today to restart a new dialogue with nature, going outside functionalism, determinism, the third way that ecology sometimes is uh, is right. So really, thank you for that. I think that at the end of our presentation we'll have to dialogue. But really, I appreciate a lot your work. Thank you so much. And I, I think it's my turn, <laughs> so it's a bit um, weird for me to introduce myself <laughs> because Antonio is not here, so I'm, I'm doing the housekeeper also <laughs> in, this, in this way, so I will tell you something about me. 
I am an architect and uh, uh, I am a landscape architect. And so I will deal with um, this topic uh, of the relation between uh, culture and nurture, and so our relation with uh, wilderness from the point of view of design, because my field is just architecture and especially landscape architecture. Uh, I am um, a professor of yeah, I am a professor of landscape architecture in Rome at Roma Tre University, and uh, I am um, in the border between uh, um, theory and practice. So I am a scholar, but at the same time I am a practitioner. Uh, I was a fellow at American Academy some years ago, and now I serve the institution as a, an uh, advisor. And uh, the relation with uh, wilderness and design is the main topic of my research recently. And for example, my latest book is um, um, titled Landscape is a Monster, um, Wild uh, uh, Urbanism and Hybrid Nature. And so this is really my core point. And this is why I met Antonio in our uh, recent uh, um, interlacer researches, and this is why I'm here today. So I, I want to um, try to uh, keep in very literal way the invitation by Antonio. And so uh, he asked us to say, what is wilderness? What, what does it mean when we use the word, uh, the word wild? And uh, I, uh, I make the same exercise made by <laughs> Katerina. So try to go back to really the meaning of the word. And uh, if we look at uh, an Italian as well as an English dictionary, we can see that when we speak about wilderness, we are speaking about something that we define as the, neg as the negation, the negative of something else. So for example, we say that uh, it is not tamed, uh, it's grow without, uh, or for example, when we think that something is wild because it's deserted, it's without people living there, not inhabited, undeveloped, not civilized. And so it's always a way to define what is wild because it is not something else. And typically what is not is what we call urban. <laughs> and uh, in fact, if we go to the definition of urban, we will find not only what for sure it's referred to city as a site, as a place, but it has also a very specific moral connotation. When we think about something that is urban, we mean something that is polite and refined and correct, that is culture. When we think about something that is wild, we think something that uh, on the opposite uh, is, uh, with, is um, uh, out of our control even in terms of moral control, for sure. And uh, uh, going to the, our imaginary, and so not staying just on the words, I think that we can justify this opposition, this uh, dualism, also, for example, in our pedagogy. These images are able to collect some references, I think, that we can share in the Western culture, in our pedagogy. And so going from uh, the tales for children to the Dante Commedia, or for example, to more recent movie, we find that is uh, in the darkness of the forest, that is in the silva, that is in the wood, that we find the topical scenes that encourage, suggest us to be cautious. So to be aware of the dangers, of the risk that are there in the world. And in the first images, for example, you can see a very old map, so to say that is something very rooted in our culture. It was a map of not explored, not yet explored land that usually were illustrated with wild animals, with monsters indeed, and with these words, ich sunt leones you are advised about that. But then what happened is that recently we are facing other kind of relation with, um, uh, with wilderness. So it is not an heterotopy yet, so it is not so far, 
in place and in time, but it gets very close to our experience. These are some pictures that I'm pretty sure you know well because they were taken during the pandemic lockdown, global lockdown, and they describe the arrival of wild animals or wild creatures and so plants and go on. They took our place in urban condition. And using this word, anthropos, taken hit from the uh, great um, cover of Nature, Ecology and Evolution in September 2020, that um, invited us to welcome to the anthropos. Uh, I don't know if they are aware of the um, you know, ironic sound of this word, but it's okay. And uh, um, what I, I, I noted, I don't know if you agree with me, is that we described these uh, events as a sort uh, of loving passion. <laughs> we were only uh, fault in love with these animals that arrived in our cities. Uh, as we suddenly discover they are present as a surprising and wonderful uh, new condition of our cities. And it was a bit surprising for me because usually, you know, we um, uh, come down the presence of wilderness in our, in our city. And so I suppose that perhaps what happened was a sort of domestic and handmade version of the sublime. You know, that was this uh, category, this aesthetic uh, category that we used during the 17th century and the 18th century to design our urban parks. It was based on the idea that you can be very imbued and you can feel pleasure and even beauty if you go very close to something that is natural and dangerous, but at the end you are safe. And in fact, uh, sublime mm, derives from sublimen, that is under the threshold. So not so far, not so close to be really dangerous. But what is happening today, uh, from some, 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 some years on, I, think I can say, is that really we are looking for wilderness. It's, it's present in every, every situation, in every expression of our culture. In these images, for example, you can see some samples that come from uh, haute couture to the literature, but even, for example, you can see on the right the portrait of Barack Obama, the president. I don't know if you noted it. I was very surprised by this um, portrait because it is the official portrait that every president at the hand of their period has to give to the Smithsonian Gallery in Washington, D.C., and it's usually very polite uh, with, you know, gray um, or beige background uh, with their attire, very controlled and polite. And instead, in these images, we see this kind of wealth of wild vegetation that's even arriving on his body, speaking about this idea of connection and of fusion between the two figures. And this is happening even in the city, and so it's not just a matter of uh, um, you know, fashion uh, or um, uh, imaginary, general imaginary, but it's, a, it's a, a, something to do with what is happening in our city. Our cities are getting wilder, more and more wilder, and this is happening for many reasons. For sure, for neglection, and it is due to the many, many crises, you know for sure, pandemic crisis, economic crisis, social crisis, even war and climate crisis that are happening to our cities. This is the case of Detroit, but we can think about many, many other cities. But it also happens for desire, because we are looking for this kind of situation. In a certain way, I, I'm very critical about that, because it sometimes be a sort of religion to put nature into the city. For example, these images are speaking as about what is happening in Paris, because in France, the use of pesticide and ch chemical products is banned all over all the public spaces. And the result is that even the core of the city that is connected with our idea of identity, of the historical power of this public space are completely rewritten re according with this new idea. But, for example, even we desire wilderness because it is ex able to express a certain idea of transgression, of freedom, in cities that are everywhere under control. And I, I used to put together these two kind of images, one very recent by Alexander Gorsky, that is in Moscow, but we can think to be in another city. And uh, this very well-known um, painting by Edouard Manet, the Degeneres to that, you know, was very scandalous. It's considered very scandalous 
scandalous. And the, the literature usually tell us that the reason of the scandalous is the naked women that is looking hard, so proud. But come on, really, can we think that uh, in the erotic Paris of the end of the 19th century, someone could be scandalized by this kind of, of situation? The, the scandals is in the men, I think, that were so well dressed with a very elegant attire, intel, in intelligentsia people or artist people that they were discussing about the sort of the world, not in the boulevard, not in the bistro, and not in the theater, but in the wood, so in a wild situation. And what is happening is that today cities are getting wild even for uh, a desire of seduction. Uh, if you think about the main transformation of one of the most important cities in the world, they are linked inextricably to a sort of a wild attire. Even because nature is consensual, you know, nobody will say that it or, her or she doesn't agree in having more nature into the city. And so it's even easy to have concerns about uh, real estate operation using nature again. And so this is the result. The result is that uh, um, cities are getting more and more wild and that the wilderness is no more in the periphery but is getting in the core of the city, speaking about coexistence between wilderness and urbanity. Uh, what does it mean to get wild? Um, again, word. I, I, I love this word. It is a French word, really. That is the French um, word marronage. Um, it, I, I, I have the, the, the meaning in, in French because it's super easy, I think, to be uh, under, un, understood. It is a sort of evasion. It is the act of people or animals who escape from their masters and get freedom. And when they get freedom, uh, they go into new conditions, into new um, uh, territories, into new sites. So I like the idea of maronage because it is not a coming back to nature. So in a sort of even, you know, conservatory approach, but it's really the meeting with something new, something that you really don't, don't know yet. It's a project, it's a creation of something new. And also I like this word because it's an action known. So it's not a state, but it's a sort of stadium. So it's uh, getting wild, not be wild. And so it's in make me uh, impossible to say, what does it mean to be wild? Because it is a process. It's something that is happening, this sort of gradient and when you are into gradient, you can say where something ends and something other begins. And so you are just there in the middle. And you have to negotiate. You have to question. You have to understand which kind of condition really makes or not the difference. And this is very interesting for me, even because it brings me to uh, rethink the very idea of nature. Uh, Antonio asked us to re uh, reflect about what is uh, wilderness, but even I think we have to reason about what is nature, <laughs> what we mean with nature. Traditionally, uh, literature presented nature as a sort uh, of taxonomy of three kinds of nature. You can see them in this picture and uh, in this description. So first, second, and the nature. The first is the, wa the, the wild, and uh, the second is the cultivation, and the third one is garden, so pleasure. Then, at the end of the, um, the 80s, uh, Ingo Kovaric, that is a very important ecologist in Berlin, proposed a new kind of nature, the fort. That is the one, you can see the picture on the right, that typically arrived um, um, in a post-industrial situation, so a post-human or a post-urbanized situation. So it is the nature that came back. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, it's not so satisfying <laughs> to think about the nature in these terms because finally it's telling us that uh, nature is a matter of history and human history. And so the first is that we are not there. The second is what we cultivate. The third is, what is when we design for pleasure. And uh, the fourth is when we um, go away. And so it's a matter of history and it's a matter of humanity. 
And so uh, I very appreciate the fact that Ingo Kovarik, the same Kovarik, go, went back to these categories in 2013, proposing a new definition of nature. He says that nature is something that you can define on the basis of an historical benchmark, yes, okay, but relying on a high level of self-organization. Wow. <laughs> what, what does it mean? <laughs> It means that for sure everyone is intermingled and linked. Uh, we are all together and we have continuous linkage. But we can think that someone out of there is living without our caring, is living with a certain degree of self-organization. Self this is very meaningful for me because it puts the idea of nature out from uh, the condition of being a material, water, trees, lawn, or what we want. It's not uh, a place, typically not urban, and it's not a time, typically pre-human or post-human, but it is a behavior. Nature is an ethos, is a way of behaving. And even if we took this, uh, this kind of definition, we can think that the other kind of creatures can think about we as human, as nature, because we are able to self-organize in comparison with a community of poplars uh, or of fishes that are out there. And so I think that finally, this is absolutely great. And just to hand, I want just to show you some samples to say how this kind of uh, idea, this idea of nature as a subject, the idea of nature as agent can enter into design. So how to design with self-organization and unpredictability. Uh, the first sample is absolutely tiny and very simple and is uh, in a garden made by Teresa Galizar, that is a landscape architect uh, from Spain but based in Zurich. And uh, in her garden of Senan, she just made a dig, collecting the soil in a pile closed there. So one meter wide, one meter deep, no more than this. And then she took the time to wait and to uh, just see what happened. And this is what happened, you know, with the season, with the time, things uh, happened uh, and uh, the snow. And at the end in this image, uh, you can even no more recognize what is, what is there. But then in May, some puppies arrived. And uh, they arrived precisely because everyone knows that Papi loves incoherent soil. And so she created the condition for agency. She welcomed unpredictability because she has not the control on what will happen, but she created the condition for something to arrive. The same kind of situation we have here, you can see a completely different situation. We are in a very infrastructured landscape in Munich, uh, and in this case, the author is Günther Vogt, and this is the park of the stadium of Bayer Monaco. And uh, in this case, it was asked to remake a sort of natural prairie according to the contest where the stadium was. And so he collected the herbs that were growing around. But then the problem is that it was, uh, okay, I have the ingredients, but which is the receipt? How can I put these herbs there in order to make a natural prairie? And so what he did is again prepare the condition. He just, as you can see, collect the seeds from uh, the, um, around uh, lawns and prairies, and he spread over the soil that he prepared. And so at the hand, the herbs decided by the, themselves where to go, if going alone, if making station, if making groups. And so having this kind uh, of uh, colors, of textures, of conditions uh, that are really independent by human control, design just prepare the condition for and take the time to wait for will happen. And finally, this is my final example. Uh, this is the conversion of a previous airfield in Frankfurt, Maine by GTL, who are the designers. Uh, uh, in this case, as the chance to transform an airplane surface into a public park. It was very challenging because, you know, it's not so sustainable to remove 
an asphalt surface of three hectares, as it was the case, uh, it's not uh, sustainable, it's not for economy, not for ecology. And so they decided to keep the main part of the asphalt um, surface as it was, and so you can see people that is using it w wonderfully for making some kind of sport. And the other parts, they just broke the asphalt, keeping it there. And uh, it was a way to improve vegetation to come there spontaneously. They just kept, um, please take, a, um, be, uh, um, take attention to this part because they just kept this passage in, uh, in the middle. What, what I want to underline is that there is no fatalism in this approach because they perfectly know how uh, the relation between soil, water, and vegetation will work. And so, as you can note, uh, they work with different dimension, different textures, the asphalt, because uh, according to the size of these pieces, some um, vegetation was invited to arrive, some others was inhibited. And so it was a way to very consciously prepare the condition for something to, um, to happen. And then, finally, this was what happened in 2019, so after about 15 years, uh, after the implementation of the site. In the middle there, that dark passage, is the passage that I, I asked you to note in the previous images. And now the condition is here. When I look at these images, I have a lot of questions. Is this natural or artificial? <laughs> is man-made or is this made by the trees? Is beauty or is horrible? Is a matter of death? or is a matter of new life that is coming? What is it? I really don't know. I really don't know how to answer to this question. And I'm so happy to not be able to answer because I think that the best questions that we need today are these kind of questions that are able to move us and to think in a completely different way. It's very risky, it's very challenging, but I think that it's the time really to face this kind of questions and of opportunities, and that is. So I'm changing <laughs> my, my hat, and so now I'm uh, uh, again uh, uh, the presenter. <laughs> and I will introduce you the um, next presenter that is here with us. It is, uh, uh, so I'm. Uh, okay, I'm moving, so I will leave the stage <laughs> to Piero Dominici. And uh, I will let you know something about him. He's a sociologist and philosopher, fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science, and official delegate to UNESCO. He is a scientific director of the International Research and Education Program, CAS, and the director at the Global Listening Center. Vice President of the World Complexity Science Academy and member of the International Political Science Association, he teaches public communication, sociology of social complexity, global networks and security and intelligence, complex systems and networks at the University of Perugia. He has participated as a speaker for national and international conferences, writes and collaborates with scientific journals, and today he is here invited by Antonio just to speak us about complex systems, that is his main topic. So thank you, Piero, for being here. Thank you so much uh, to my colleague uh, and uh, to the whole organizer for this uh, invitation that uh, uh, meet deal with the particular fundamental question of topics, uh, not only for uh, uh, the academics and the scientific researcher, because uh, we are dealing with the particular age of uh, obsolescence of every knowledge and skills with uh, uh, an age with uh, uh, a deeply uh, anthropological transformation and paradigm shift uh, that consists in the substantial uh, overturn of the complex interaction between uh, uh, biological evolution and cultural evolution. 
Uh, in my opinion, uh, the, uh, the same idea that uh, uh, complexity can be managed is uh, a contradiction in terms, because uh, it's based on the gigantic uh, confusion between the complex uh, system and complicated system. Complicated system are artificial and mechanical system are based and characterized by linear interaction and relationship. Linear, that means uh, uh, explainable in terms of uh, uh, cause-effect, uh, stimulus, and response. And the complex system are uh, vital system, are uh, uh, organic system, social and human system that uh, characterize but a lot of parts that um, in, in with the interaction, in which the interaction is systemic. They are character, characterized uh, from, uh, from uh, emergent properties, from the capacity of uh, the out-organization. So I have to uh, share with you a lot of things and ideas, and I, take, I, I took a lot of notes. So I prefer to read uh, something that uh, I hate, but uh, I think that uh, we have a few minutes, but um, then I'm available to share with you debates and questions. So, uh, first, first of all, um, so we are dealing with a, a particular uh, anthropological transformation. In my opinion, the technological transformation is an anthropological transformation, and we are dealing with the uh, the problem, the fundamental topic of uh, an irreversible synthesis of a new value uh, systems and evaluation criteria. And uh, we are dealing with the, uh, the global extension of all political, social, and cultural processes. This is the substantial overturn. Uh, this, this slide uh, means uh, try to share with us the idea that uh, uh, social and cultural factor in the future uh, will be more and more important because are able to uh, determine also the choices of the science. And we are in a particular age that we have to uh, discuss the traditional idea, concept and paradigm of science. The classical science uh, and the paradigm of the classical science is based on uh, some epistemological principles that are discussed at the moment. For example, the principle of causality, the principle of uh, observability. For example, uh, between the characteristic of the complex system, not all the dimension of the complex system are observable. And when you, can, when you are not able to observe, you cannot measure and you cannot predict the phenomenon. So managing complexity is only a slogan, in my opinion. It's a contradiction term. So I will try to share, and now you read, I hate, but sorry. Uh, to share with you some key points that uh, hold together, I try this, uh, the fundamental issues and topics we are debating today. First of all, some premises. Most of the systemic problems uh, we face, uh, including the pandemic, are based on the gigantic confusion, as I told you. We perpetuate at all levels, pedagogical, educational, training, organizational, macro systems, between complicated system and complex system. A confusion that leads us to rigidly separate uh, disciplinary fields and approaches that, on the contrary, should be integrated. An example, in Italy, but not only in Italy, at the level of the public discourse, every academic, every scientific researcher is for the multi-inter-transdisciplinary approach, is for systemic vision, is for the contamination of knowledge and skills. In reality, these are obstaculated. For example, when we publish uh, something on a scientific journal with a high impact factor, but these scientific publications are outside 
of our scientific sector, this publication, international project, are not evaluable for the Ministry of Education and for our career. This is a problem. This is a, the problem. And the, uh, the challenge of complexity, of, uh, or hyper-complexity, are educational and training challenge. We are continuing to educate and train our students, our researchers, our scholars, inside a monodisciplinary approach, inside the idea that we can continue to keep separate something that is deeply interconnected. Another point interesting uh, also for the perspective of Antonio. The comparison with plants and wilderness is particularly interesting. For many years I've been talking about the urgency of rethinking our organization and social systems as organism that mean complex system and not as mechanisms. We are dealing in the same condition with uh, uh, parts that uh, are in interaction, that are interconnected. But there are, there are some substantial difference. Complicated and complex system. In the complicated system, it's a problem, also uh, an epistemological problem, a problem of system thinking. In the complicated system, you can divide, you can separate. When the system doesn't work, you can separate the, the part. And isolated the part, you can try to solve the problems. This is also an, a metaphor of uh, analytical thinking, the Cartesian tradition thinking. Okay? The problem is that uh, now, at the moment, we are dealing with the problem that uh, for the solution that is always temporary and provisional, we have to try the connection between the parts of the system. And I think that uh, this is, should be also the fundamental objective and goal of education. Educating to see and make connection. So, uh, we continue to be educated and training, to isolate, to separate, identify a single object, mechanical, causal, analytical thinking, what is deeply inter interdependent, interconnected. In other words, we are taught and learned that the solution of, to our problems are related to the possibility, ability and capability to isolate the individual parts. You can think also to our clock. When the clock doesn't work, we can try to observe which is the part that we have to substitute. On the contrary, assuming that there are definitive solutions, always provisional and temporary, this can be found in the possibility and in our ability to identify, recognize, investigate the connection, the correlation, the interaction between the parts that constitute the systems. This is, should be <laughs> the primary function of education. Uh, so, we are dealing with uh, some particular kind of system that, uh, whose name is uh, complex adaptive system. This is a particular kind of complexity, a particular kind of complexity uh, which is characterized by constantly dynamic uh, uh, evolution, non-linear non evolution, emergent properties that are observable only in the course of the non-linear evolutionary processes of the systems themselves. So we are not able to predict this kind of phenomena. It's not a, a termo terminological or semantic problem. And uh, any type of complex system, biological, social, human, can only continuously adapt to change to external perturbation. So the problem is how to recognize this complexity without falling into these typical errors, 
that characterize I'm so happy I'm not so happy to share with you this problem that characterize in particularly and first of all our educational and training institution that are built constructed on logics of separation that produce determines not only the separation between the scientific sector but only the separation between people between their experience and so I think that the future belongs to uh, to all that be able to heal this kind of fracture heal this kind of fracture uh, this kind of uh, what I call the false dichotomies this is an old table Okay, you know the mean that of false dichotomies. I try to identify these false dichotomies and uh, which are, what are the effects of these false dichotomies. We are in a particular age where the traditional boundaries are completely done away with. What are the, and which are the, the boundaries between natural and artificial? the historical dichotomy between nature and culture, but also the actual dichotomy between uh, uh, skills and knowledge, culture and technology. Te in my opinion, technology is culture, is inside the culture, is a complex product of culture. So, Life and its social, human, relation aspect uh, have always been complex and have always constituted a problem of complexity. Uh, complexity is a fact of life and not is an option. And complexity, it doesn't mean more difficult, bigger, or uh, uh, is not a definition of uh, uh, a confused situation. The dimension of complexity is a glance, is a, an epistemological approach that uh, emphasized, underlined the systemic and relation dimension of every phenomenon. Complexity, you know that uh, generally we use uh, complexity as uh, 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 a word solution and not, not a word of problem, as, as told us. Uh, my friends and master Edgar Morin. And this, uh, I think that uh, we have a lot of implication also for the public sphere, for our political regime. You know that uh, in these last decades, the problem is that we continue to try simple solution to problems that are complex. That it doesn't mean more difficult. Complexity, it's important to be clear, exalts, emphasizes, and highlights the radical interdependence and interconnection of processes and phenomena. And another point, point that is fundamental, because when you study and make research about complexity or to world complexity, the opposition, the conflict with the others, is based on the idea that uh, you want to eliminate you want to contrast the ideology, not only the idea, of simplification. Allora, we should be clear. The opposite of complexity is not simplification. The opposite of complexity is reductionism. The general tendency to explain the problem with the, the referment only to one approach, only to one scientific sector, only to one system of variables. So, we are realizing that the world and the reality are complex. It doesn't mean uh, more difficult or bigger or confused and undefined. In other, words, in other words, that all the parts of the process that constitute them are interdependent and interconnected. We are realizing that everything is held together. 
by systemic relationship. But, but as I told you, we are continuing to keep separate because uh, human beings uh, have a lot of, of fragilities, of uh, vulnerabilities, because uh, we, as human beings, are incomplete. We are in a condition, uh, uh, you can think uh, to Herbert, the Nobel, Pri uh, Nobel Prize in economics, uh, Herbert Alexander Simon. We are in a general condition, existential condition, of limited rationality. And about this, I would like to show you a slide that synthesizes something that I have called the great illusion of this hyper-technological and hyper-connected civilization. The same illusion that uh, push us uh, to think that uh, in this particular age, that is an age of uh, uncertainty or complexity, we need only technicians. We need only hyper-specialism, hyper-specialized profiles. And we uh, construct our educational and training institution on the false principles of uh, usualness, of knowledge and skills. Fundamental, as I told you, that be aware that the opposite of complexity is not simplification, but reductionism. At the same time, be aware that simplification is an important value, but it's not uh, an absolute value. There are something, dimension of uh, social praxis that uh, can be simplified. Other, no. Education, communication. Communication is age, in this age was reduced to connection. The reductionism of education produced the idea that we need for this hyper-technological era and age only digital education, only digital literacy. I have a lot of critics also for what I call the STEM doctrine, in my opinion, personal opinion, but I'm able and try to, to discuss this with you. I think that this is another way of reductionism. But I'd like to, to show you this slide that synthesizes the principle characterized of a complex system and complicated system. And um, Yes, but the great illusion. Okay, so we need to rethink radically education. I think, that, as I told you, that the, the challenge of complexity, of complex system, our educational and training uh, challenge, uh, structured on rigid logical separation, on monodiscipline, on false dichotomies, on disjunctive thinking, the Cartesian approach is important, is fundamental, but uh, it is uh, a disjunctive thinking. We are continuing to educate ourselves and the other to the idea that we can manage the complexity, manage the complex system, separate and isolating the parts. So we, are, we have, we must to recover I have to finish, I'm 20, yes. We have to, re, uh, must recover the complex dimension of, of uh, educational complexity. We need to construct, to build a culture of error. We need to try to, always about uh, the, sorry, the false dichotomies. We need to recover the emotion we need to recover the, all the more creative disciplines. And we need a renewed dialogue between knowledge and skills, art and science, between humanities and science, 
but we need also with because we are in the um, civilization of automation simulation of uh, artificial intelligence and i think that uh, the problem is not to be uh, in contrast to this kind of uh, revolution i think that we need to redefine a systemic interaction with the machine we need to another time to heal the fracture between the human and the technological. Thank you so much. Thank you, absolutely. Piero, it was crucial to have your speech as the final one <laughs> among us, because it was so important to uh, clarify the categories that we, we use. I think that uh, we are all there, and I think that uh, in what Katerina showed us before, and also in some of the samples that I displayed before, there are many, many things that uh, resound in your, uh, in your presentation, and very uh, admire from the clarity of your presentation, and uh, I think that uh, this kind of view where are so clear the way that we usually use to divide the, the word uh, into fighting uh, uh, categories uh, is the, a very important starting point to try to find uh, new words. Because at the end, I was, I was thinking we need something that is in the middle. Uh, because we have really, I think, I don't know if you agree, we miss the word to say because we speak about imagination uh, versus rationality, but where do they meet? How can we call the meeting between technology and culture, between theory and practice? And so perhaps it's a very important uh, exercise, these are words, to try to make new crises or something like that that can uh, help us to uh, express a new, a new word. I want just to go on and uh, uh, close our presentation with the one that um, uh, Antonio prepared, Antonio Ire prepared, and uh, there are two interviews, they are 10 minutes, um, with uh, uh, two professors about uh, um, the relation in particular with uh, plants, and I'm, I'm trying, sorry, to open it. Um, Yes, it is. And so two um, uh, professors uh, from uh, two different uh, uh, university, one from Uppsala, uh, that is Velimir Ninkovic, and the other from the University of Padua, that will speak about plant communication and the behavior. Uh, I am uh, Velimir Ninkovic, has been working with uh, uh, plant plant communication last 20 years. Uh, very keen in understanding of the processes in plant society uh, and uh, whether these uh, processes may have uh, broader ecological implication. I am a scientist working in cognitive neuroscience and plant cognition that has done his research in different laboratories around the world, in Australia, in France, in the UK and the United States. Uh, nowadays, I am at the University of Padova within the Department of uh, General Psychology, where I teach the first course uh, worldwide on plant cognition. Since uh, uh, many years, <clears throat> I study motor control in different populations, including neurological patients such as Parkinson's disease, uh, by using bioengineering techniques. In the last few years, I am applying a similar approach to the study of plants movement uh, a shift that uh, determined a profound change in the way I thought movements are planned and controlled. You are surprised all the time when you're working with the plants because uh, you believe that plants, as many of us believe, that the same organ, organism that only born uh, by propagation organisms that start into to, uh, life of the plants and they die, they are more or less doing nothing. Look really closely, you can see the plants are able to do many, many nice uh, things. What, what surprised me uh, a lot, uh, that the plants has ability to discover and uh, detect the signals from the neighboring plants uh, and respond accordingly to the, their to grow 
strategy of their neighboring plants. With other words, they can very easily to adapt to their competitors or probably to their parents. I have probably a little bit uh, different answer that, that you should expect it from that. Uh, my first contact not by, was directly with the plants. Actually, my uh, brother, who is seven years older than I, studied medicine science. And uh, he was all the time, I was a small kid looking what he is not doing and uh, all the time thinking that human being has possibility to express or, uh, and uh, explain symptoms of certain diseases, etc., and then making that according to that information, you can make diagnosis uh, and give probably proper treatment. But uh, then I will ask myself actually the question, how we can uh, help the plants, because the plants cannot give us almost any descriptions uh, of their problems uh, and they are stressed, they are exposed to disease, they are exposed, etc. So, and how we can, are able to help them to survive. And that is was my first uh, um, question. And then I decided, okay, instead to be medicine doctor, I decided to be a plant doctor. Okay, I have, actually I have two episodes. The, the first, more than an encounter was a, a collision. As a, as a little boy, I received a pedal car as a gift and driven by an uncontrollable, unstoppable excitement, I started to pedal so fast that I lost control of the steering wheel and I clashed badly against a huge tree. Since then, I realized <clears throat> how plants can be solidly anchored to the ground and strong. Uh, the second was a smell-driven encounter, the basal plants that were always present uh, in our kitchen. Uh, I remember vividly to be driven towards them by their smell and the sense of admiration for those beautiful leaves emitting such a pleasant smell. Since then, basal uh, plants are family to me. The more I study plants, the more I realize that we humans are not that special and that cognition and sentience ought to be traced back to the very root of the tree of life. Recent empirical discoveries uh, strongly suggest that the behavioral repertoire of plants contains much more than hardwired reflexes. Plants uh, appear to behave in ways that are adaptive, flexible, anticipatory and goal-directed. Taking this into account, uh, I argue that plant behavior is in many ways analogous to animal behavior, meaning that plants are suitable candidates to be described as cognitive agents in a, a non-metaphorical way, uh, even without a brain. And uh, this aspect has the potential to change dramatically our conception of central nervous system. On a daily basis, I'm thinking about that. Uh, uh, and uh, all time, uh, I'm astonished because the plants is not a uh, centralized organ, organism as uh, animals, insects, human beings. Uh, they made decisions probably locally, on, even on cell level. So how they are doing and how to organize all the, the cells, uh, all the tissues, uh, all parts of the plants, it's very uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, for me, I haven't found any, uh, in my research, any organism that can be responsible in the plants for that. Is that shown previously some literature that, of course, there are some organisms that are responsible, for instance, for catching the reflected light from neighboring plants, that's true. But in the case of the volatiles, uh, which are, I'm studying mostly, uh, we couldn't find any specific organisms. Where, where these organisms can be located, that is also a question. Darwin is all time talking that the brain uh, of the plants is, are roots, is roots. Uh, and whether or not they true, I don't know, but uh, plants as 
uh, are usually not all of them have can live uh, in a two different environment below and abo above ground and they can utilize that to be in the environment at a very in interesting or interesting level uh, and that that is probably also giving the idea where this brain should be storage if they're existing then uh, how this is first part the second part uh, if they are doing these decisions on making decisions on uh, cell level there should be a specific organelle uh, in uh, in in the plant in cells that making the decision storage that decision and uh, making that still we don't know actually unfortunately uh, there are a lot of speculation that we are working now and uh, hypothesis uh, testing uh, fortunately none of them that i have until now working and i couldn't discover that so this is something mystery still for me okay thank you thank you very much yeah that's fine. Um, okay, this is. I want to applause Antonio for his work, and it was a brilliant and uh, even able to organize uh, all this uh, meeting, even with these uh, uh, guests from uh, outside. So um, interesting in the relation with uh, with plants. So I don't know if uh, Caterina and Piero have some questions to to make each other or some observation or final remarks about our dialogue. I don't have any questions, um, but I find ourselves very much in what Piero has been saying and in the need for um, to educate to complexity um, and especially from an, a young age and not cut this need of beingness other than, you know, the disciplinarian knowledge boundaries that they give us. Um, yeah, in arts and science, uh, we see that this connection between ways of being and ways of knowing is extremely fruitful uh, to move forward, to grow our curiosity, to, uh, how can I say, to, it's ne nearly a respect towards the other. It's, um, you develop a sense of care and of need towards what is not you um, and I find that this is extremely important um, to understand our place in the universe and how we are connected with nature self organizing itself ourselves but also technology we can perhaps leading to what you were saying technology is self-generating it is nature so can we accommodate and welcome this in our being. And I guess it is really hard for us at our age to get there. Why not, you know, start from when we are young um, and allow people to freely, wildly search their own ways. Um, you were talking about governance, yes, there as well. complicated problems. Uh, I try to integrate uh, your comments and uh, uh, let me tell you that uh, I found uh, a lot of affinities, not only um, epistemological, methodological, but also about uh, sensibilities and, and, and emotion that uh, I think that uh, are a fundamental part of uh, our role of uh, teacher, educators, and, and researcher that are continuing to, to think, to define as uh, 
technicians, as uh, you can think, to an errand, to mere executors of educational processes. But education and teaching is, uh, first of all, relationship. And relationship is complexity. For the future, for the future, that it doesn't mean more difficult or bigger. For the future, I would like to clarify that we don't need experts of everything, because it's impossible. Generally, at uh, the level of uh, the grand uh, narrations of the media, of the uh, media ecosystem, uh, we assist to the distinction between the hyper-specialized profile and the experts of everything, and not a false dichotomy. I think that uh, for the future, we need a concept that uh, I proposed at, uh, at the end of 19. We need hybrid figures. I'd like to clarify that uh, we need the scientific sector. The problem, the fundamental problem, the strategic problem is that we construct and define social and cultural and power condition, logic of separation or logic of power, that uh, make impossible the dialogue, the contamination between the scientific sector. And I'd like also to be clarified that uh, because we are dealing also with, the, in this moment, the hegemonic paradigm of education. That is the idea that the hybridization and the contamination between skills and knowledge can be realized from uh, the software education, the robotic uh, education, the digital literacy. I think that uh, we can try the condition of this fundamental contamination. Because also in, in the last uh, uh, emergency of the pandemic, uh, we assisted, we saw that uh, the logic of separation make us a lot of problem. Deterministic and reductionistic approach uh, could be lethal for us. I think that the contamination and hybridization between skills and knowledge could be and should be realized. Try to prepare our scholars, our students, our son. Uh, first of all, at the level of uh, epistemology, methodology, the level of logic, the level of thinking. I think that uh, in these last decades, underestimate the role or the, imp the importance of thinking. And we think also that we can delegate the thinking to the machine, because we think that uh, it's more important the action, the praxis, the fact, the evidence, the quantitative data. And so, we lose, we lose the qualitative dimension of complexity. We lose the qualitative dimension of human and human beings and social systems. Uh, you can remember the principle of observability. Thank you so much. I, it's very inspiring, and uh, I want to thank you and. Um, Above all, thank Antonio Ire <laughs> that uh, was the master of this uh, dialogue and uh, he put us together. And so I'm very, very sad that he's not here. And I'm absolutely sure that he will be happy to hear from, uh, from us and will be so close to our position uh, as well. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, um, we can uh, agree together that is the time to be into the problem as on our way stated. And it's no, not just to try to solve it, but to work perhaps uh, with approximation and so to try to nurture the culture of error of to be wrong because to be wrong is the right way to find new strategies and new tools and new categories for the future because otherwise we will just repeat what we already know and there is no future if we just 
and continue to do what we already did before. And so this is a great challenge to be in the problem, to be in the conflict, to be in the horror, but I think that uh, is really a so great chance that we cannot lose it. So really, thank you all, thank you to, thanks to the Uzbekistan Pavilion, who host has for all the support. And uh, so go on, each one is filled with um, these researchers. So thank you all.